Thanks, Susan. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, having me. And I can't think of a more fitting location to talk about dogs, but particularly the history of science. So thank you ever so much for inviting me. Um, so in this talk uh, today, um, I'm going to be talking quite a lot about Wonder Dog, which is my um, new book, which is about the kind of science of um, animal minds told through the perspective of dogs. Um, and it's a story that kind of charts 150 years of science and for me, really amazing characters, really. So as I say, it's, it's the perfect place, really. It's really exciting to kind of talk about it. So, um, yeah, we'll start off perhaps in the first third. I'll talk a bit about why I wrote the book and the really kind of cool, exciting stuff we're learning about dogs um, and their cognition uh, right now. And then second third, uh, I'll talk a bit more about the history and about, you know, one of the really attractive things for me, and I keep thinking about this, is... is Actually, the story of science, when we communicate science, it's often a case of like, hi, I'm here to tell you how this thing works, and you're going to go away, and you're going to think, well, that's great, I know how that works. And actually, right now, our perspective of what is kind of truth, scientific truth, I mean, it is something that changes. And that's something I've learned from writing this book, really, is that I used to think science was its own thing, its own window into understanding you know, unknowns. But I kind of realised from writing this book that actually science and culture are really entwined with each, within one another. Um, so the second third of the talk, we'll talk a bit about that. And then the end is, um, is much more a kind of, uh, you know, now we know this, you know, what happens next um, to our relationship with dogs. It is such a strange relationship. I know we kind of take it for granted. We look at all of the incredible animals out there in nature, dolphins, butterflies, lizards, worms, lobsters, crabs. And then we look at dogs and we go, yeah, dogs, they're just dogs. But actually, you know, dogs are super weird in evolutionary terms. You know, these animals that have adapted to the human ecosystem. And even regardless of the fact, you know, we've done all sorts with their breeds. Actually, as an animal, they're really, really unique. And my, my feeling is they're an animal which um, gives us a new way to look at animals and their brains and their experiences. It kind of, dogs are a gateway drug, I suppose, to understanding much more about animal minds. We do have a dog in the audience. Can I just... Uh, big shout out to Lily up there who is probably going to be my first non-human heckler. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's hope. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, the, the, the book, um, as a science writer, I've worked mostly for The Guardian, and um, as part of that work, I've covered lots of things, chimpanzees and toads and frogs and uh, newts especially, and I've loved it. It's been great. But every now and then, uh, I've come across um, dog research, the incredible things happening with dog cognition research. And I've always been like, that's really interesting. I really want to cover that. I really want to cover that. So in the back of my head for quite a while, I was like, I really want to do dogs at some point. And, um, and that opportunity uh, came uh, through Bloomsbury Sigma. And I was like, this is great. This is great. And the more I looked into dogs, the more I was like, actually, there's a much bigger story. So there are many books written by fantastic cognition scientists about how dogs experience the world. My book is kind of looking at that and then um, putting it into the context of what we learned in the past and what we might, where we might go, I suppose, in future. So, um, the first third, I just thought I'd outline some of the um, really interesting stuff going on with um, dogs right now within the uh, cognition sciences. And for me, I think they're, they're, dogs are kind of answering these really big questions in animal behaviour studies. So... 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the sorts of questions I used to marvel at, it's dogs that are helping us answer those questions. For instance, our first question is, you know, how well can animals understand uh, languages? In the 80s, lots of research on um, primates, um, particularly uh, vervet monkeys, about their styles of communication and what, what noises mean, whether noises, signals, if you like, can actually you have the same function as human words, these sort of big questions. And actually, dogs are a big step forward in our understanding of that. And I love... Does, does anyone remember this, this, this dog called Rico? 
It was one of the first dogs, these sort of super genius dogs that can remember hundreds, more than a hundred words for objects. And there used to be a show, when I was a kid, there was a show called You Bet. I don't know if anyone remembers You Bet. And the German version of You Bet, uh, Rico, which is the dog on the left, um, the Rico's human companion, got Rico in a nice arena, not unlike this, put hundred, more than a hundred toys around the edge of it and mentioned each toy by name, and Rico would obviously fetch it. And that's a great example of a wonder dog, okay? So it's a dog that is influenced science, a, a well-kept family companion dog that's uh, really influenced science. So that was on You Bet, Rico was on You Bet, and um, two cognition scientists were watching telly in Germany that night, and they saw this dog, and they were like, that is really, really interesting. That's really interesting, because we can't get that sort of uh, behavior. We can't train in a fun way. We can't necessarily train captive primates to do stuff like that. And here was a dog having the time of its life, running around the stage, collecting up all of these different toys. And it spurred uh, National Geographic to have a, um, uh, a competition to find other super smart dogs. Um, so this is uh, Betsy, and Betsy could do 300 objects by name. They were also capable of doing uh, fast mapping, which is basically the dog, if we imagine we invited a dog up here, and the dog knew the words for this excellent book. So it knew book, paper, cup. No, it didn't know cup. So dog runs in, you say, get the cup. And the dog runs in, well, that's not a cup, that's, that's a book, that's paper. I don't know what that is, it must be a cup. And that's something that human toddlers do, and it was realized from that study that, goodness me, you know, this dog, as I say, having fun, having the time of its life, was able to do it as well. And later on, there was another dog called Chaser in 2010. Chaser managed to learn the words, he managed to learn a thousand objects. It's just like unbelievable, you know, levels of uh, training went into this. In fact, the trainer did so much that eventually, once they got to a 1,000, they were like, there's no point in going further. It's taking too much time. We just know this dog can carry on doing it. And in fact, that dog was able to do many-to-one mapping, which is basically, it could understand that um, wonder dog. You could say, go and get wonder dog, go and get the book. And you could say, go and get the book, and it would go and get the book. But if there was lots of books here, it would still be able to get wonder dog. Does that make sense? So it's categorized. It's got two different categories. That one book and the concept of book, I suppose. So, excellent example of like how, you know, through human companionship, we can really get an understanding of feats we never thought dogs were possible. Uh, we never thought dogs were capable of, I should say. So that's like one example. Another is, um, can animals feel emotions uh, like humans can? And this year, in fact, this is a good place to talk about this, is the 150 uh, years since Darwin published the third in his kind of trilogy, uh, Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals, and posited that idea, you know, are human emotions unique, or is this human emotions are on a continuum and other mammals, perhaps other animals, are also on that continuum? And that was unanswerable, basically. There's no way to do it until dogs. Again, dogs. So this is um, some fascinating research done at Emory University in the US, where, again, uh, family dogs trained very carefully, lots of patients involved, trained to um, basically get inside an fMRI scanner, sit really calmly, and allow their brains to be um, scanned. And the fascinating, genuinely fascinating thing about it was when humans go into a scanner, and you show them you know, a picture of their loved one, there is a part of the brain that lights up called the chordate nucleus, and that essentially is um, hmm, it's a, a marker for a pleasurable feelings, you could say. Now, that's what happens when humans go in, and the big question was, well, we've got, finally got an animal we can do this with. We're going to put that animal in there, and we're going to see whether the same bit of the brain lights up when the dog sees someone pleasurable, someone pleasurable. So first they did it with treats, bing, that part of the brain lights up, and then they did it with the uh, sudden arrival of the human companion, and it, the same thing. Now, I should point out that not all dogs did that, which must have been mortifying for some of the owners. <laughs> but yeah, on the whole, you know, the, the, the dogs were responding in a way um, that, that mirrored um, human minds, which again is really, really fascinating. And I, I think there's a, a lot of potential, um, perhaps, for, this, for these kinds of studies. 
So again, big questions, finally getting some sorts of answers, you know. Can animals attach like us? So for a long time, um, the dog's attachment for us, we considered it, in fact, I remember being taught this, you know, dogs, essentially, it's covered love. You know, they want to attach to us because we're where the good times are, we're where the rewards are. And in fact, um, once again, uh, some really interesting recent um, studies, the last uh, six years, um, to do with, uh, oxytocin, which I'm not going to call, I know it's a, it's a dirty word this, right? I'm not going to call it the love molecule. Um, but this is a really, really, uh, another good signal, another good flag, I suppose, for understanding um, positive emotions. So in mammals, oxytocin is a way to um, socially bond individuals together for the good of their genes. So, you know, mother and baby, for instance, that's a big surges in oxytocin, keeping that bond tight. And we see that in, in uh, dogs, but the most amazing thing is humans sitting with their dogs in a sealed room, when those two individuals gaze at one another for long periods, you see oxytocin rise in, in both species. So again, the marker, if you like, of potentially pleasurable feelings, um, it's all there. And I think dogs go up uh, by about 150%. Their oxytocin levels, humans go up for about 300%, uh, on average, that is. So again, this gazing, this interaction, this strong attachment, it's not just a uniquely human thing. There is, you know, there is, that is evidence, if you like, that it's technically a two-way street. And again, these really exciting um, studies. I've included a picture here of Jethro, which is Mark um, Beckoff's uh, dog, um, American ec ecologist. And... Um, this was the first dog to have a, you might have heard of the self-recognition test, the mirror test in um, lots of mammals, particularly primates. Are they self-aware? Can they recognise themselves as individuals? And actually Jethro um, had a slightly different test. Uh, his was the sniff test, because obviously dogs, you know, that's a very strong sense for them. So it involved um, Mark allowing his dog to urinate in the snow, picking up the snow, moving it elsewhere, and then watching when the dog did the reverse circuit, whether there was interest in that uh, patch of snow or not. And in fact, Jethro comes around as a sniff. Now, I know that smell, it's me. We think. I'm putting words in Jethro's mouth there, which is very dodgy. But, but you know, that's, that, that simple study, which went on to actually um, uh, encourage scientists to do laboratory studies involving canisters of urine, discovering the same thing. Again, that study, using a, a, a companion dog is what uh, launched some really, really interesting science and again a different way of thinking about traditional zoological ideas of mirror tests and self-recognition. Can animals understand human gestures? It's another great story involving a wander dog actually. So for a long time, um, Tomasello and other uh, evolutionary biologists, they pictured humans as uh, particularly unique among apes because we are or were thought to be the only apes capable of understanding the point. So, as humans, that seems to be an innate thing, a point. We understand the concept. It's kind of strange when you think about it, this concept of this invisible laser beam that I can point at anything, and you will know generally what I'm talking about, where I'm talking about. So it seems that that's quite a difficult concept for a lot of primates, and in fact, most mammals. Uh, and Tomasello is in a lecture theatre like this, saying, this is it, you know, Humans are unique. This is a definitely a human, very unique, singular human thing, the pointing. And someone from the back of the audience shouts, my dog can do that. It's a very famous story among ethological circles. And, um, and the individual, the student at the time at the back, Brian Hare, uh, good on Tomasello, he did what every good scientist should do and said, oh yeah, well prove it. And that's exactly what Hare did and the two of them published. And in fact... Um, can I just see hands up who does have a dog at home? Okay, that's a nice sort of test you can do, um, you know, for yourself. It took about six months for our dog to kind of get it. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, another fascinating aspect. And, again, it's another wonder dog story. So, again, real important push forward in our scientific knowledge, courtesy of a relationship between scientist and um, dog. I've got a couple more, nature or nurture, one of the longest um, debates. You know, that's as, almost as old as this place, that debate. Um, dogs giving us more and more windows into um, some answers there. 
And I was particularly impressed with um, researching the book with Bridget von Holtz's uh, studies in Princeton, um, looking for markers on genes of kind of sociability. So there are two key genes... And the more insertions, kind of mutations, on those genes, the more social the animal that results. So wolves have about two insertions. And her studies of lots of different dog breeds showed between three, four, five, and sometimes six insertions. Now, dogs with six insertions are super, they're kind of hyper-social, they're called. So they're incredibly friendly, really interested in human connection, dog connection, and also they suffer the negative effects of being connected in that they don't like being left alone, it seems. So this, this genetic aspect to it is always is also really, really interesting. And von Holt's dog here, Marla, is, is hypersocial. So again, there's that, that interesting connection between science and their dogs. And as we'll come to see, that's a connection that I would say uh, Charles Darwin and other scientists that were around when this amazing building um, was founded, that's the kind of relationship between dogs and science, I think, from my research, that's the sort of relationship they had as well. OK, one more. My favourite, actually, um, uh, is just, it's, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, and it's um, research done by Andrea Horowitz, and um, essentially one of her studies involved painstakingly watching dogs play in slow motion and picking apart the intricacy of their behaviours. Now, we've all seen that at the park. You watch dogs playing and it's like, oh, isn't that beautiful? They're running around. Oh, they're noisy. Or... But actually, when you look in slow motion, there's this kind of weird interplay where one dog normally wants to play more than the other dog. And that dog, my dog, Oz, is a little bit like this. That dog is using every trick in the book to try and make the play continue. So if it's a big dog and a little dog, then the big dog may well roll over and yeah, come over here. They call that a self-takedown. So the smaller dog will go, oh, yeah, I'll have a little nibble at the undersides. Or if it's a two medium-sized dog and this dog's looking over at the birds over here, then this dog will be like, woof, 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 actually getting in the line of sight. So we talk about human gestures. Actually, there's an understanding there that you, know, you want to attract or keep the attention of a dog you want to play with. That will involve um, behaviourally manipulating, I suppose, um, the situation to kind of get what you want. And since looking at that study and since um, talking to Andrea, it, I'm just like, that is just a, a, the best example, I suppose, of how we can understand animal behaviours. I mean, there's, mammal play is very interesting in its own right. It's, quite, it's fairly unique among animals, as, as you guys know. Um, but her studies in particular are a great example of how we can use, learn with dogs and apply that to, um, to nature, particularly to chimpanzees and to primates, uh, other primates as well. So my point is this. Great science... Understanding so much more about animal minds is fantastic. It's the coolest thing ever. I really, really, you know, as a, all of us, I assume, are into animal behaviour. Like, this is, if these were chimpanzees doing this, we'd be like, God, that's exactly what we expected. But, you know, these are household uh, animals, or, or at least the, the dogs we have in the Western world, you know, fit that sort of category. And they're connected. They are companion dogs. They are family dogs. And they're contributing to science in a really interesting way. So when I started off researching the book, I was kind of like, okay, this is great, I'm really interested, I'm going for this, Lots of, so, so much interesting science. And in fact, that's the way I've always written science previously, is kind of like, well, let's just explore what animals are telling us and you know, celebrate, I suppose, the scientists that are helping us learn. But actually, the more I looked at that strange wonder dog relationship, the more it made me want to look back in time and to... Um, study a bit more about um, the history of dogs in science. And what I discovered was, uh, predictably, it's like a... Uh, it's kind of maelstrom, maelstrom of characters and um, culture and opinions and belief. All of these things are swirling around um, when this building, you know, when it was made in Darwin's time, where there were still street dogs running down Pall Mall. It was a, a really, really interesting place to, you know, to begin the book. So right now, the kind of science where we're at, if I was to make a true statement, a scientifically uh, accurate statement right now, I would say dogs are emotionally complex, and by studying them, we can better understand the minds of non-human animals. So that is where we are right now. But obviously, if we go back in time, 
that uh, scientific truth, I suppose, would look different. And for the next third of this talk, I'm going to go through, decade by decade, the changing uh, scientific truth. And we're going to start off um, with 1887. So 1887, if someone was to come into this lecture theatre <laughs> and give a talk on dogs, the first thing they would say very confidently is, dogs, they're not psychic. That is kind of where certain aspects of animal behavioural science were at at that time. And um, the way that was proven, that dogs didn't have some sort of psychic sense, was actually um, George Romanes, who was a... I, I was going to say understudy of Charles Darwin, but that's probably not fair to Romanes. But um, his, his uh, methodology, I suppose, by today's standards, is fairly simple. Um, essentially, what he did is him and his mate went to the park with the dog, and um, mate here with the dog, and Romanes goes for a walk. And then the dog is released, and the dog follows the trail. So that's step number one. But the interesting thing, the switch, I suppose, is dog, friend, Romanes, come back, and Romanes and his friend swap boots. And then his friend walks off, Romanes walks off, and then the dog is released, and the dog follows, predictably, the smell of the boots. And at the time, it was like, oh, yes, we've really discovered this incredible thing, brilliant. Um, that was the kind of level of uh, dog cognition studies back then. So it's normally scientist and their dog, and potentially a mate at the park, <laughs> uh, but genuinely discovering new things. So it's, that's very important. But that was the kind of level of um, dog science at that sort of time. Another example which I love is um, uh, John Lubbock, um, his study of dogs and um, little signs. So his poodle, a dog named Van, um, Lubbock, who was a bit of a polymath, as many of them were, he invented the bank holiday, actually. Um, but he essentially made three signs at first, water, food, and out. And he let the dog roam around. Uh, Van picked up the water sign. Here you go, have some water. The dog picks up the food sign. Here you go, have a treat. Picks up the out sign. Go on, out you go for a wee. And <laughs> predictably... After three months, I mean, Lubbock had gone on to other ones. He'd gone on to a sign with bone written on it, and he'd gone on to uh, had another sign with tea written on it as well. Um, and, yeah, predictably, um, as you would expect, Van was able to quick, quite quickly um, operantly condition, although they didn't know that word back then, but condition um, uh, herself to pick up the right sign. And they're thinking about 150 tests at the end, at the end of this long training trial, um, Lubbock found that in 150 tests, predictably 110 were to do with food. <laughs> but interestingly, we would look at that and sort of go, okay, well, that's clearly an association there. But Lubbock looked at that and said, well, the dog can read. He can read. And he even wrote out words phonetically in the end. And in some ways, I kind of forgive him that logic because it's like, well, what? You know, that's quite, very interesting. And so that kind of idea of um, dog minds, if you like, being capable of human things was kind of starting to swirl in the ether back then. Interestingly, as a quick aside, has anyone just hands up seen, um, there's a couple of dogs on Instagram that have sound boards. Has anyone seen this? Yeah, so this, this is it's so interesting. And as I said, this is the first time I've written a history of science book, but it's like loads of these things you keep going, oh, well, that was like in the, that was like in the 1890s, you know? And you see these ideas coming back and back again. So these sound boards, for those that don't know, are essentially a bunch of buzzers and you can draw or labels on them, and the dog um, is seemingly able to communicate. And obviously, there's a the same argument runs, you know, runs onwards exactly as it did back then. The dog understands words, or is it just conditioning itself to get the rewards it wants um, by choosing the right options? It's still fantastically impressive, by the way, that dogs are able to do that. So that was. Um, that was Lubbock. Um, things get a little bit more rigorous, I suppose, with Conway Lloyd Morgan, um, from whom we get Morgan's canon. So Morgan uh, was his, his, his dog, I think his dog's called T yeah, Tony. <laughs> um, this is Tony here. And Tony um, managed to work out how to open the latch on this gate. 
And, you know, famously, the neighbours were like, that is a very clever dog, that. That is a, such a clever dog. I can't believe it can use a latch. Um, and Morgan actually started to investigate how it is that dogs were learning this trick. And in test number one, scrabble, 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 you know, scratching at all sorts of parts of the door. And after about 20 minutes, hits upon the latch, door opens, job done. And interestingly, he was one of the first scientists to, to say, OK, well, what's going to happen in the second try? Because the second try was 15 minutes. OK, interesting. Third try, the dog scrambles, 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 and gets the job done in about 10 minutes. And so what you see when plotted on a graph, if you've got trials on the x-axis and time to complete the task on the y, is you're kind of in the area of the first learning curves, which again is a, you know, a, a concept we talk about all the time in maths and science. So Morgan famously came up with Morgan's canon, which is um, often still used by psychology today, often used in animal behaviour. And it basically states if an animal does a behaviour that is really unique and kind of strange and seemingly super intelligent, then the most simplest explanation is probably the correct one. Now, that sounds a little debasing to animals, but actually it turns out that's actually a pretty good way of studying animal behaviour to, to get to the crux of what and why animals behave in the amazing ways that they do. But the pattern with these three, I call them Darwin's disciples in the book, but the pattern with these three is um, they're very much uh, a sort of almost anecdotal. There's a little bit of sort of... Uh, <sighs> I was going to say whimsy about it, <laughs> but it's not quite a fair assessment. But essentially, you know, one or two interactions with one or two dogs, I'll write that up, and there's some great science. And that was the end of an era. Because at the end of the, uh, sorry, at the end of the 19th century, as the Industrial Revolution was really faced, getting grounded, um, a different kind of science um, was establishing, establishing itself at a far greater rate and that science um, was mostly based in laboratories. It was actually very interested in longer-term studies of dogs. And um, much of those, many of those scientists uh, were really interested in the kind of humanitarian approach. So in other words, they wanted to benefit human uh, lives. So predictably, Pavlov, Ivan Pavlov, fits into that mould. And uh, as a side discovery, he was most interested in um, the mechanisms for digestion. Um, as a side effect of that, discovered um, what we would later call classical conditioning. And that sort of science was long-term. So get your dog, and you need to keep that dog for as long as possible alive and in good condition while you are um, assessing and understanding more about the science of um, uh, the body's workings, I guess. Now, I uh, confess to not knowing enough about Pavlov. Um, my... Uh, what would it be? Psych I suppose my first year zoology study, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you where I went to university to protect their identity, but I'm fairly sure it involved um, some pictures of uh, an elegant Russian guy dressed very nicely with a dog or two patiently watching, and he's ringing a bell. And um, if you also <laughs> remember being taught it like that, Again, this is a great example of how culture and science sometimes just go off in different directions, because actually the... the the, um, what, what actually happened uh, is kind of gruesome. And I chose, I actually felt it needed to be in the book because my gut feeling is for us to adequately improve our relationship with dogs and other animals, you have to understand where we've come from. You have to understand the junctions of our learning and the characters, and in this case, the kind of brutality. Um, involved. And in the book, I've moved most of that to the further notes at the end because I know naturally some readers just can't read that and that's totally understandable. But the two facts that I found kind of um, uh, awful about, just to remind you, so um, Pavlov would make a fistula, uh, sort of an open hole, if you like, in the, the dog's uh, throat area, and then through some piping could... Uh, farm the saliva, if you like, and keep it in a, you know, collect it in a container. And as I said, you know, they're very interested in keeping those dogs living for as long as possible so they could see over time how concentrations and volumes of saliva changed. And in fact, he was producing so much dog saliva um, 
about 6,000 liters a year, he was bottling it up and selling it as a cure for dyspepsia, which is uh, acid reflux. And he was funded, something like two-thirds of his research costs were funded by his selling dog saliva. Now, I did, I did not hear that in the lecture when I was, what, 20 or so. So, absolutely, I think it's important that we know um, the kind of, what that science was like um, and uh, the impact it had on the individual dogs. In fact, I name um, that there are some of the, some of Pavlov's dogs, uh, their names are still known to us today. So it felt kind of fitting to include that in the book. But clearly, Pavlov and that idea of classical conditioning, so, you know, just to remind you, we're talking about a uh, dog sees person come in with the food, dog starts salivating, okay? So the dog is conditioning itself, if you like, to that. The appearance of that person is what, the, what causes... If you imagine it's the brain's basically uh, finding a, a quicker circuit, if you like, between experience and bodily reaction. And Pavlov realised that, you know, the appearance of that person, it could be anything. It could be a buzzer. In fact, there was no bell. Uh, that's a translation, we think, of the word, the Russian word for buzzer. So there was buzzers, electric shocks, metronomes. Um, and it was that uh, association, if you like, that, that Pavlov found so interesting. And not just Pavlov, of course, because, again, I, writing about the history of science, one of the things that I was really surprised to learn and to sort of get a feel for is that you see these big ideas, Pavlov's big idea, wow, the brain can sort of retrain itself to associate things that happen with rewards or punishments. And that big idea, it spread. It's like, they're like seeds went into the sky and they went across continents and they found their roots in universities all over the, the world, particularly in North America. And Pavlov's idea of the brain almost being a blank slate um, that is influenced by experience really, really did, um, really did spread. Um, in terms of classical conditioning, this is another thing that's just, it's just so interesting. Classical conditioning, okay, so you can get results. You want to train your dog to salivate at the sound of a bell. That's one way of doing it. The dog gets a reward. But clearly animals, especially dogs, I would argue, can change their behaviours according to punishments. Um, so if a dog's punished, it won't do that again, okay? Now, that idea, the effect of, um, of negative um, actions on a dog's personality was what flew especially in Germany. And um, uh, Colonel Conrad Most um, was one of the most influential dog trainers. And in fact, he independently hit upon Pavlov's ideas, something Pavlov freely admitted. And the reason this is interesting is because that style of dog training and this is, again, what I said before. Science is not operating independently. It is pulled upon by culture in all sorts of ways. So that style of training, the effect you can have with negatively um, uh, treating you know, a dog in a negative way to get the behavior you want, that's what's bred. So from Germany, uh, after World War I, and interestingly, after World War II, and the USA also hit upon this by World War II of training dogs in that way, um, we saw these brains, these intellects, these trainers leaving Germany and heading over to the, to the US. And in fact, uh, Rin Tin Tin, lots of these Hollywood dogs, uh, Strong Heart, uh, what's the dog in? Toto. Uh, so they're all trained by the same person who was um, one of the, the graduates um, of Conrad Most. And also, of course, don't forget that in the middle, after World War II especially, in America, massive boom in um, dogs. Dogs, that's kind of when dogs really hit, you know, that idea of there being the nice lawn, <laughs> uh, white fence, and the dog running around, that's when that idea really spread. You've suddenly got loads of people looking for ways to train these out-of-control dogs. Where do they turn? To Hollywood, to this book, which is still in print as well. So the idea of conditioning a dog through punishment, essentially, is what sort of soared in society. Now, we now know, of course, we all know that dogs can be um, encouraged to do all sorts of things through positive um, uh, actions. And 
I don't know, I think there's an alternative universe where Conrad Most hit upon positive rewards training. <laughs> we didn't have to endure 50, 60 years of quite barbaric treatment of dogs that still goes on, as we all know, um, today. So, as I said, this kind of link between science and culture, we just, I don't see it enough in science, um, in science books. So it's a real pleasure to, to get a chance to talk to you about that. And in fact, that links quite nicely to our next decade, uh, 1946, where we've got uh, Colonel Moss's ideas of how to train. You know, dogs are there, you've got to be dominant, you've got to be, you know, on top of it. They're violent creatures. And then you've also got um, uh, Conrad Lorenz and ideas of, in on aggression, but ideas of aggression and nature red in, um, in you know, tooth and claw. And that directly influenced um, a guy called Rudolf Schenkel, who was studying wolves. And his studies of wolves were very interesting. They showed that clearly there's a lot of interactions, aggressive interactions between wolves. Clearly wolves do a lot of um, gesturing of their own. But essentially, wolves, when they meet, went the thinking in 1946. Wolves, when they meet, they battle. And there's a top dog. There's an alpha. Every dog wants to be the alpha. No one can be the alpha apart from the alpha. <laughs> And that idea, in fact, that was the first time really that was used in an animal behaviour context. And just as I said, the mid-20th century, everyone's looking for ways to train their dogs. At that time as well, we have much better um, evidence that dogs essentially were a special brand of wolves. So everyone's like, how do we control these dogs? We want to keep them in our houses. They're important status symbols for us. We love our dogs. How do we treat them? How do we care for them? Okay, let's look to the, the wild beast. And dominance training is clearly... Um, uh, I was surprised at how prevalent um, it still is in many parts of the internet, and many trainers today still use this idea of the dog has to walk in front. Uh, sorry, the dog has to walk behind you when you go through a door, um, and the dog has to eat after you eat. So these ideas and these the usage of alpha male. I have a, I have a Google alert for alpha male, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's kind of depressing to be honest. You know, Trumpism very much when Trump was in, it was most of. The these emails were about alpha males. Now, the reason that's frustrating, of course, is because there really isn't such a thing as the alpha male. Because about 20, uh, 30 years after Schenkel's studies, um, wolf ecologists started questioning Schenkel's original study. And guess what? Schenkel's original study was done on zoo animals. Captive wolves, unrelated to one another, forced together in a cage. Of course they're going to fight. Of course there's going to be aggressive interactions. Now that's, that's exactly what I mean when I say about this, this thread between science and culture. Science is telling us in 1946, wolves, you know what? They're, they're, they're really violent. Dogs, by association, you've got to be on top of them. And then... 30 years later, science is saying something else. It's saying, actually, clearly mammals are dominant with one another, but essentially, the alpha is the breeding male in the pack, or the breeding female, or both. There isn't this constant struggle. There's only a complex uh, set of eco ecological behaviours that we see in wolves and other mammals. So, science says that. Culture runs off, way, let's go over here, let's get really, really negative, let's really, really punish our dogs. And then over here, we've got the science changing, and the horse is bolted. And I think that's one of the things, as science communicators, all of us, uh, that's, our, that's one of our main jobs, really, is to make sure that science and culture are pulled much more tightly within and, uh, and, and um, inside almost one another. And I don't see that massively with dogs. Like every, I would say every scientist that I spoke to, and hundreds I'm talking as part of research in this book, there was always a moment where they said, oh, can, can you make sure you mention about um, the importance of positive and reward training? And that isn't necessarily what we see in culture. I'm sure it's changing, but it's about the speed of change, I guess. So, 1950s. Pavlov's idea is still lingering around. In, in America, it's been sort of, uh, I was going to say perverted. It's been, it's been sort of focused into uh, a real radical behaviorism, basically. So the mind is almost a blank slate. 
And we are all born blank and learn to associate good times with actions we should repeat or reinforce, bad times with things that you should definitely not do again. And this idea uh, through B.F. Skinner um, really, really was making moves. So you can see in this picture, the top left picture, Skinner's one of the reasons I just find it's absolutely fascinating is in World War II, he was involved in a thing called Project Pigeon, which some of you know about, I'm sure, which involved um, conditioning pigeons to peck at certain parts of a dashboard in a missile to keep the missile on track so it could reach its target. And that was very close to being um, used. The American government eventually sort of shook their heads and went, oh, I don't think that's going to work. But that idea and the effects that um, conditioning could have on animals in terms of getting them to do interesting stuff was clearly something that was a passion for Skinner. And in fact, the picture, there's six squares there, um, and you can see at the top left, Skinner's conditioned, he's invited journalists into his research facility, and he's proving to them that um, he can get a dog within 20 minutes to jump up against a wall. And the way he did it was by um, having a secondary reinforcer, basically the strobe light from the, the camera, the journalist camera, was what was essentially training the dog, if that makes sense. So the, the strobe on the camera is a bit like Pavlov's bell. It's something the dog associates with a treat. And so by taking photos when it's jumping up on the wall, the dog is essentially being trained uh, to jump up um, uh, on command, seemingly, within 20 minutes. So these ideas were very, very fashionable. Again, the word culture comes in there, very, very fashionable. But actually, um, cognition was just getting started. And what kind of led to the downfall of Skinner and these ideas, I just think it's really interesting, is like, you, there are certain animal behaviours, and we all know them, that clearly have not um, come about by experience. So they've clearly not come about by um, nurture. So one of them is, uh, hands up the dog people again, how many of your dogs... Do, uh, keep your hand up if your dog does a little cutesy spin before it gets to bed. Okay, some of you. So, and then keep your hands up. Uh, well, actually, okay, hands down. Thank you very much for that. Um, so the other one, I saw it recently with our dog. But it was when he was a puppy and he first... He's just, he used to wee like this. I can't believe I'm doing this in this theatre. It's not the most elegant thing, so he used to wee like this. And then suddenly he just went, Whoa! and he sort of looked, I'm lifting up my leg, oh my God, this is a strange sensation. So radical behaviourism can't really explain that kind of thing, these strange innate behaviours that animals um, clearly have within, within their genes. And it was that understanding, that more modern understanding of genes, that kind of led to radical behaviourism radical behavior kind of wobbling a little bit, and the wheels were kind of starting to come off. And then the sort of end, if you like, to behaviourism uh, as a dominant force within psychology and animal behaviour actually came about by a study that all of us, have, anyone with a dog has been influenced by, but no one's ever really heard of this study, which is a shame, so it gives me great pleasure to talk about it to you guys today. Um, so this uh, John Scott and John Fuller, um, some of the earliest geneticists, and in fact every at one point, every big name in American genetics had visited this research facility to get ideas. Um, it's in Bar Harbor, in Maine, in the US, a long-term study that ran for uh, 10 years, and it involved getting six different breeds of dogs and changing small variables in their lifestyle and their experience and watching what adult dog they became. And it was the first good evidence we had that um, uh, uh, dogs, a better predictor of behaviour is not breed, it's uh, sex. So it's the first, the first evidence we had of that. The first evidence we had in dogs of hybrid vigour, so the mixing of breeds, how that can result in a really, really, a kind of boost, if you like, to the health of an individual. But crucially, it was the first study, bear in mind it's a 10-year study, um, the first thing to look at the impact that raising puppies in different conditions have. So certain puppies would be kept away from humans and the impact on what kind of adult dog they became was studied. And that was basically a dog that did not like interacting with humans, very scared of humans, very much uh, quite timid, kept themselves to themselves. And then you had dogs who were um, allowed to socialise as puppies and then you had dogs that were not allowed to socialise as puppies. 
And these dogs, the dogs that had loads of experiences, particularly in that period from 2 to 12 or even 16 weeks, were the puppies that were kind of best adjusted. So can we have hands up? Uh, again, dog owners, sorry to keep doing this to you. Okay, so you will have, when, 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 if you had your dogs as puppies, I assume you had that socialisation period. You had lots of people saying to you, you need to make sure your dog's out and about and hearing loud noises. That is because of the science that they did. You know, they worked 10 years of their lives on this. And in fact, they were so humble. They were like, it's okay, everyone knows all this stuff. We put in all this work, that's totally fine. But again, wonderful characters investing so much of their life to understanding dogs, but also uh, to understanding the human condition as well. So both of these scientists uh, had lived through um, two world wars and had seen uh, shell shock, and the impact of trauma on young soldiers, and they were essentially gathering evidence to prove that people aren't born bad, that trauma has a massive impact later on in life. And in their own way, they contributed to things like CBT, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy. They're sort of linked to those psychological advances. So it's not just dogs. You know, a lot of these scientists had big, um, uh, big aims, humanistic aims, um, so as I say, it's fantastic to tell that story. Now the other, the other out, um, the other uh, big conclusion from that study actually is really interesting. Is you know, if you're looking and raising these different puppies in different conditions, once you know that raising puppies in bad conditions meet, leads to um, dogs that are you know going to suffer trauma later on in life or have uh, not as healthy a life as these dogs here. Once you know that, once you've proven that, as they did. You can't justify that kind of research anymore. So that study was very, very important. It changed um, the use of dogs in research in America. It changed the use of dogs in cognition research so much <laughs> that by the 80s, dogs were just considered dumb wolves and you shouldn't study them. So that was the sort of science that I remember um, in the 90s, is this idea of, OK, you want to study zoology? OK, what are you going to do your dissertation on? I'm going to do it on geckos. What are you going to do yours on? I'm going to do it on uh, mice. What are you going to do yours on? I'd like to do it on my pet dog. No, what are you talking about? Now that's changed, but that idea of dogs being corrupted by association with humankind was prevalent. The idea that actually involving dogs in science is a big no-no was also prevalent. So instead, the cognitive sciences, as we all know, focused on uh, gorillas and chimpanzees and dolphins, those animals that have a really big brain-to-body ratio. And it was from those animals that we looked for evidence of uh, you know, consciousness and self-awareness and theory of mind. That was where our focus um, really, really, really was strong. And it was in, only in about 1999 when scientists, uh, it was actually, I would say, one of the most influential um, was a research group in Hungary, the Family Dog Project, that I'm sure some of you have heard about, who basically started thinking, in fact, in fact the Family Dog Project is another great example of a wonder dog. You've got um, uh, ecology department, if, sorry, an ethology department studying animal behaviours, laboratory full of breeding fish in tanks. Okay, looking at the genes of breeding fish. And the person that runs that institute, um, a guy called Sanyi, uh, is walking on a mountainside and, wow, discovers this stray dog and the two of them really form a connection, form a bond. And this, psych this scientist who runs this research facility comes back with the dog and the dog spends lots of time with Sanyi and um, starts... Sanyi keeps a diary and starts thinking, well, why is the dog doing this? And I'm like, oh, goodness me, the dog's doing that. How is it doing that? How does it know that? How does it know this? And essentially says to uh, his other academics within that institution, let's change our focus. Let's move the fish out. And let's study family dogs because they can teach us and maybe open up and help us explore all sorts of other kind of weird and wonderful research questions. And the number of... These guys are still producing... As you know, I'm sure, they're still producing hundreds of research papers. But the efficiency with which they were generating conclusions and moving the debate about uh, animal cognition forward meant lots of other research institutions found. So now there's uh, more than 50 around the world working with family dogs, helping us discover all the things that I... Uh, mentioned at the start of the, the talk, the fantastic science coming out now, and that will continue to come out with dogs. My message, a big message, and I hope it rings true throughout the book, is, is that 
The more compassionate we are with dogs and all research animals, the more intelligent they've shown us to be. And the last 20 years have been a really, really, really good um, demonstrator of that concept. So that's the message of the book. That's the, the big feeling I've come out of. Now I've finished the book, that's the big feeling that I feel is, that's there. Um, and that <laughs> essentially puts us in a really unique place right now. At the moment, what the science is telling us is that these are really, really deep, connected, emotional animals. But that's not the end point. This is not the truth, this is, this is where we are right now, but I suspect our knowledge and our understanding of dogs is going to continue to improve. My, my guess, my gut feeling is it will be through research like this. So I'm really confident and hopeful and I get a kind of tingly feeling in my back just, just wondering these big questions and whether we will get there with dogs. You know, are dogs going to be the animal that we explore consciousness with? We don't know yet but we're still looking for this excellent research animal. Could it, we, could it be dogs that help us do that? Autobiographical memories is one of those, I think this with my dog all the time, is can Oz, that's the dog, can Oz reflect on what happened on a walk a few weeks ago? Does Oz remember when he was a puppy? Like, does he get, you know that feeling we all get sometimes when you remember something from childhood, and you're like, oh, or a smell of a toy you used to have, or something like that. I get it with Star Wars figures. Do you think dogs do that? We don't know. We don't know if they can um, revisit, if you like, those autobiographical memories. At the moment, through um, uh, Horowitz, Andrea Horowitz's studies, the ones I explained about slow motion dog play, that tells us we think dogs have a rudimentary theory of mind. That's her conclusion. But, you know, how much more have we got to understand about dogs in terms of uh, whether they understand theory of mind, of course, whether they understand they are just one mind in a sea of other minds? Uh, do they understand that they have a different perspective to other individual dogs around them? We don't know yet, and that's really, really exciting. And the most important one is, you know, if we're saying dogs are emotionally complex, if we're saying that they attach in a really strong way, we are clearly opening up the debate about um, the suffering of dogs. Um, the dogs who are still used in research facilities, the dogs clearly in some parts of the way where dogs are part of the menu, and also, of course, um, dogs uh, still used in um, laboratories. In the UK in 2010, this is the last recorded data, dogs used in laboratory um, in, me in medical um, uh, treatments went up, actually, by 3%. Still in the thousands, it's, I think it's 3,000, but, you know, this isn't... We shouldn't just forget, I suppose, that dogs are... We like to think of dogs as, you know, our animals. They live in our houses. But, you know, many dogs are still in medical institutions, uh, research institutions, I should say. And, of course, 80% of dogs on the planet are street dogs. And they are living their own lives, still within the human ecosystem, but they're still living their own lives. So these are really big questions. And I, I wonder, and in fact, I kind of, it'd be, I'd be certainly be really interested to hear your views on how that relationship might change in future. So like I say, that's this kind of story of Wonder Dog. It's the second time I've ever talked about it to anyone. <laughs> I spent the last three years sat at my kitchen table just typing away. But it's really um, just talking to you about it. I, I feel like, yeah, I hope that message comes across really strongly that we've really hit upon a really interesting way to explore animal minds as a whole. Um, and I can't wait to see where this kind of science goes. So thank you again for having me. Uh, as I say, I can't wait to hear your questions. And um, viva la wonder dogs, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>